I wrote a book uh, about 10 years ago about uh, how man-made chemicals in the environment disrupt hormone development in, in wildlife and humans. If you were to update the book, what would be some of the things that we, you would include? What are some of the new science that we've learned since then? We've learned an awful lot since Our Stolen Future was published. We learned, first of all, that the types of questions we asked in the book were on target. Science was pretty uncertain. When we, when we wrote it uh, 10 years ago, we acknowledged that in the book. What we were really trying to do was to stimulate research to resolve the uncertainties. And now, 10 years later, we've got a lot of answers. Um, we learned that the questions we asked were right. Uh, they were troubling. Um, and now we are confident that the types of issues we raised were the right ones. But we missed some. For example, at the time, we had only the slightest hint that obesity and type 2 diabetes might be in the collection of diseases that uh, are tied scientifically to endocrine disruption, the subject of the book. N now, there's a lot of information emerging that says this is part of the problem. And that has an interesting implication. Um, type 2 diabetes costs the U.S. about $218 billion a year. And if these new data that are coming out are correct, the good news is that we may actually have a new way to prevent that disease by intervening and reducing the exposures that are contributing to it. What are uh, some of the changes that we've seen in public policy in response to the new science or, or lack of changes in public policy? What's been the response? Well, the science has galloped forward. Uh, tremendously. Uh, we're living now in a period of intense scientific revolution uh, in our understanding of the links between the environment and health. The policy wor world has lagged far behind. In fact, it's become very apparent that today's health standards, not just with respect to endocrine disruption, but more generally on a wide array of issues related to contaminants, those health standards are in the scientific Jurassic. They are so far out of date that we know we can't depend upon them to protect public health. There's been a, a lot of talk about bisphenol A is, a is one chemical that's gotten a lot of attention lately, and you've come to Minnesota to talk a little bit about it before the state legislature. Can you share with us what's the latest science on bisphenol A? The latest science on bisphenol A actually has to do with type 2 diabetes and obesity, um, that research that came out this past fall. And it's showing that uh, in Americans um, around the country, the risk of type 2 diabetes and obesity and heart attacks is increased significantly in association with uh, levels of bisphenol A that aren't, aren't that high. They're, they're higher than average. But bottom line, um, it's indicating that uh, that's one cluster of diseases that uh, bisphenol A may be contributing to. Another important one um, is some results that came out uh, a couple months ago um, showing that three of the standard chemotherapies used to treat breast cancer are rendered virtually useless by bisphenol A, at least in uh, experiments with human breast cancer cells. We don't yet know how that plays out in people directly, but we know that if you look at how those cells behave, those breast cancer cells behave, uh, it's changed dramatically and their ability to respond to chemotherapy is reduced dramatically with bisphenol A levels that are actually within the range that people are exposed to. In trying to uh, address and respond to this new science, what do you think the role should be of, uh, of consumers and people, moms and parents? Unfortunately, the system we have today requires moms to be chemical engineers when they go shopping for their kids, and that's, that's just not right. 
we, moms are too busy. They've got too many demands in their time. They should not have to worry about what's in the products they're buying for their kids. And yet the system we have today does a much better job at protecting, protecting those products than it does at protecting children. In trying for, for governments to try to deal with all these chemicals, there's a lot of activity at the state level in Minnesota and a lot of other states, and then there's some activity at the federal level and at the international level. What's it going to take to really develop a, a comprehensive system that protects public health? Uh, and what, what do you see as the obstacles to, to getting there? That's not an easy question. Um, there are some paths forward, however. I think the, the probably the most crucial step that needs to be taken immediately is to get the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, to deal honestly with the science. And frankly, that's not what's happening today. The FDA is failing us, not just on bisphenol A science, but on peanut butter science, on salmonella, on a wide array of problems that uh, consumers have to confront. If the FDA were to, to deal honestly with the science, then it would send signals that would make it much easier for uh, states to develop appropriate legislation on bisphenol A and related issues. It would send a clear signal to Congress about what's necessary. It would also move the U.S. from a laggard in international chemical policy potentially to a leader. And so I, I view FDA reform, getting honest people in the FDA, looking clearly at the science and bringing their assessments up to date. As, as a key step that will unleash uh, uh, progress in a whole series of areas. One more. Um, is it possible to produce some of these chemicals in a way that is not, uh, that are not as damaging to, to the environment? There's a new field of chemistry called green chemistry, which is very exciting. Until this discipline began to emerge, and it was founded maybe 10 to 12 years ago by two chemists named Paul Anastas and John Warner, until then, until they started asking questions, it wasn't the responsibility of chemists to ask, is the material I'm making toxic? Basically, they made it, chemical engineers, and then figured out ways to use it, and it went into the marketplace almost always before any serious testing took place. And that's why we have so many materials in common use today that uh, liter literally are hazardous. This emerging field of green chemistry, however, is saying it's, it's our responsibility, our responsibility as chemists to ask first, what do we know about designing molecules in a way that avoid known hazardous properties? And that's what this community is bent on doing, and, and I'm very hopeful that they're going to be a major contributor to solving these vexing problems. Thanks very much.